studied here a few years ago for a uh, master's in human centered systems. And um, my master's project was the, uh, the design and build of a multi touch uh, interactive tabletop at the uh, Microsoft Surface uh, called the Mesotop. That's here today, so you might get to uh, have a look at that and have a go if you do one of the lab tours or if you stay for the event in the evening. Um, and since then, I've been working here on a number of research projects. Uh, one that was uh, finished quite recently was um, looking at using technology to support um, creative conversations in small design groups. And we were using uh, projectors and uh, Wii remotes and other things like that to create interactive surfaces on walls and tables and um, investigate how uh, these kind of things could affect how the groups are working together if they could support uh, creativity and things like that. And um, something we've been working on more recently is uh, an information sharing system for an ambulance transfer service at uh, Great Ormond Street. And they transfer uh, critically ill children from uh, regional hospitals which don't have the facilities to care for these children into uh, much larger London hospitals. And uh, we developed a system uh, that tried to stay as much out of the way of the doctor's jobs as possible. So there were no kind of touch screens or pads or anything like that. We used a very simple system using digital pens that capture information written on the forms. So the doctor's jobs weren't changed, they carried on recording information as they always did. But we digitised that information immediately. It transferred wirelessly back to a base station and the control room we had a, a large touch screen on the wall that would keep the, uh, the doctors in the office immediate up-to-date information on uh, what was happening with these children. Um, so that's examples of some work I've, uh, I've been doing recently. And um, today we're going to be talking about uh, future interfaces. And um, I'll start with a bit of, bit of history and kind of background into, uh, into interfaces. Um, I, uh, I doubt anyone in the room has uh, ever had the, uh, the opportunity to work on a device like this, and I, I certainly have. And this is um, a, uh, a punched card machine, and the very early computers ran on pieces of cardboard with holes punched in and they were fed into the machine and it read them, and it would carry out the, uh, the instructions. So there was no screen, no switches or anything like that to interface with it. You, you recorded your instructions on a piece of card or stacks of cards, handed them over to the operator, and then Later on in the day, you might come back and you get your results on a particular paper, or if the machine crashed, you didn't get anything. So here, the computers were so low powered that the, the interface, interface simply didn't exist. Um, computing was, uh, kind of computing power was so expensive that an interface would have been completely over because you wanted to have all the power going towards your calculation. So back in these days, humans very much had to fit around the computer and not the other way around. Whereas uh, we're quite lucky that things have, uh, things have moved on. Um, two other kind of major paradigms in, uh, in interaction you'll, uh, you'll be um, uh, familiar with. The command line interface, which involves typing commands into the computer. And you have to be, uh, there's not much tolerance for error here. You have to know the commands or you have to look them up. Everything has to be written in exactly. Um, so it's not easy for beginners. But if you know what you're typing in, it can be very quick or very efficient for controlling the computer. And then we moved on to graphical user interfaces where you can explore a bit more and uh, it's easier to, uh, to find your way around systems like this. So from there, uh, there seems to be a consensus now that we're moving towards the age of the, uh, the natural user interface. And um, uh, what was five years ago, uh, still in research labs and in films such as Minority Report and things like that, the things have come on very far, very quickly and uh, we're now seeing being able to use uh, gestures, motion control for devices, shaking your iPhone to shut the tunes, um, being able to uh, use things like the, uh, the Microsoft Connect to, uh, to interact with games without needing a control at all. So we're, we're entering a new, new era of interactions. And uh, today we're going to look at um, a number of uh, devices and technologies that are uh, very new or in development. They're going to change the way we're looking at how we interact with computers and uh, how we think of the interface. Okay, so I'm going to start with quite a uh, quite a simple one. This is a, a new product, some ski goggles made by a company called uh, Zeal. Uh, these are available now, and they've got a, a very simple 
uh, built-in computer into them. There's some large, easy-to-use buttons on the side. You can use when you put your snowboarding gloves on. And then inside the goggles, there's a, uh, a miniature display mounted uh, on the bottom of one of the lenses. And um, this actually um, is, a, is a projection display. And it appears like the, the display you see is, is about a metre and a half or so in front of you, so it doesn't actually seem like it's right close to your eye. So this is uh, quite a simple device. It just gives you things like speed and your, uh, and your orientation and things like that. Um, but it's, it's a taste of what, what I think is to come uh, with, uh, with how we're going to be able to use um, these displays. Um, so here, you don't, you don't need to take a display out, you don't need to focus on something, it's, it's right there in front of you. Um, okay, moving on from that, this is a, a similar system developed by NEC. This was introduced in 2009, so it's been around for a couple of years now. It's quite a professional high-end system, expensive, um, costs around about, uh, I think it's about £137,000 per user, based on buying a 30-user system. So it's definitely a, a high-end thing um, that you're only going to see in industry. And this actually, again, uses a similar projection technology, but it, it projects the display actually onto your back of your retina. Um, sounds quite, uh, quite genius, a little bit mysterious. Um, but what this means is that um, you can still make eye contact with someone uh, when, you're, when you're talking to them and still be seeing the display in your peripheral vision at the same time. And they see a market for this with um, engineers and technicians, people like that who maybe have to consult documentation when, um, when making repairs or developing decisions or something like that. Um, future uses that they're penciling in for this could be uh, live translation. It's controlled by a computer that you wear on your, uh, on your hip, which looks a bit retro actually there. And um, they, they see that this could be doing live translation, you can use subtitles. Um, immediately uh, if you're talking to someone who's speaking a different language. So moving on from uh, input to the eyes, now looking at using, uh, using your eyes as a, an input device for controlling the computer. I'm sure a lot of people here will be familiar with um, eye tracking for research and usability studies. This is a, uh, an eye tracking device made by Toby. We have one of these here at the university. It's, um, it's an excellent device to work with. It's very accurate. It's very fast results. It takes 120 measurements of someone's eyes a second. It is accurate within half a degree, and it's great for doing really detailed research work. But it's big, it's quite clunky, and again, it's very expensive. This costs the university over 1,700 pounds. That's 17,000 um, pounds. So this is strictly lab stuff at the moment. Um, but uh, there are there are uh, improvements being made in these areas at the moment. And uh, the item on the left there is um, basically the same eye tracker but condensed down so it's small enough to fit under a monitor and can be moved around quite easily. And um, on the right hand side is a, uh, a joint venture with Lenovo, which is a laptop with an eye tracking device built in. You can see that it's, it's not ready for the main time yet, there's still quite a bulky, uh, bulky unit bit on the back of the monitor there. Um, but with things like this, we can now start to look at how, um, if the computer can know what you're looking at on the screen, um, what kind of uh, advantages that can bring us for designing an interface. For example, on the laptop there's some software that will uh, scroll the document that you're working on as you go towards the bottom or the top of the page. Um, it can, uh, you can do things like zooming in, you can dim out or brighten up certain areas of the page, depending on what you're doing and uh, what you're looking at on the screen. And, uh, this is a um, this is a tablet that's using head tracking. So moving off of my tracking, now looking at tracking heads. And um, this is um, it's coming off the market soon. It's made by a, a French company, EVI Group. It uses a camera to simply track the movement of your head. And you can control the cursor on the screen just simply by moving your head slightly. Now, I think this is it's quite an interesting idea, but. Um, I'm not convinced of the of the real the real use for this. They're using Windows 7, which is, as we know, an interface designed for uh, for mouse and keyboard predominantly. Anyone to use Windows 7 with touch, you know, it's not it's not that great. They're trying to uh, uh, trying to kind of fit extra technology onto this that really really don't work. 
Um, and here you saw the cursor, there was a green circle that was moving around. It's quite large. To select something, you have to hold your head still for a second, which is fine for clicking, as we saw in there, but there were problems if you wanted to, to drag something. For example, to move the scroll bar uh, or make a double click. So I think there's um, some shortcomings with a device like this using a standard desktop operating system. Something like this would be better with a custom operating system or custom applications that can really take advantage of, uh, of this new, uh, new kind of interaction. Um, now here's uh, another example that you might have seen quite recently of uh, head tracking, again using just a normal camera in an iPad. And they're using this to, uh, to give the impression of a 3D display. So basically, the, uh, the camera in the iPad tracks the position of your head using your eyes and other facial features. It can see the orientation of your face. And then it can generate a fake 3D effect that from one person's point of view is very, very realistic. Um, and uh, there could be some interesting possibilities there for interfaces where you could peek behind documents or if you're working with a few things at once, instead of switching between the windows, you might be able to tilt the iPad or the screen to, to see behind something on the screen. Um, and here's another example uh, of a game on the, uh, the Nintendo uh, DS, which is in exactly the same technology. And uh, it's really quite, uh, really quite effective. So moving on from um, uh, head tracking and eye tracking and other forms of tracking like that, we're now going to look at uh, gestural interfaces. And the, uh, the real big news here at the moment in this area is the Microsoft Connect, which uh, has which completely shaken up this, uh, this area. The, uh, the Connect was launched at the end of uh, 2010. It's an add-on camera for the Xbox and uh, it's been phenomenally successful. They sold uh, 10 million units so far, and uh, it even entered the Guinness Book of Records as the fastest selling uh, consumer electronics device, so faster than iPads, iPhones, and stuff like that. So a lot of these have been sold. Whether people are playing with them, using them, who knows. Um, it's, uh, it's got two cameras. It's got a, a normal webcam built into it, but it's also got uh, an additional 3D depth camera. Now, um, when a computer, in the, the traditional days of uh, computer vision, when we're using a camera to, to track someone's movement or to, uh, uh, to track people interacting with something, it's very difficult for a computer to look at an image like that and understand what's going on. For us it's easy, we can see there's a person, they're waving, we can make sense of that. But for a computer just seeing a map of coloured pixels, it's very difficult to, uh, to take into account moving backgrounds and things like that. Whereas the, the addition of a depth camera in this device really opens up new possibilities. This is what the Connect sees with the depth camera, the same scene there. So uh, things that are close to the camera are a different colour to things that are further away. So it's very easy for it to remove anything that's not interesting. So the background it can get rid of and it can clearly focus on whatever's in the foreground. So the people who are interacting with the system. Now this opens up a, a whole lot of possibilities for, uh, for new kinds of interactions. And, uh, and software. Um, this is an example of how it can map a, a skeleton onto, uh, onto your body and from then it can work out what position your arms and your legs are in. And um, something great that, uh, that happened with the Connect is a new tool like this comes out and uh, that's the first thing that's going to happen is people are interested in taking apart the machine learning the software, get hold of these and they find out how it works and they manage to, to get into it and um, get data coming out of this. So that opened up uh, a whole load of possibilities for using this and making your own, your own interfaces, your own gestural software, not just the games that came with the Xbox. And there's, there's a whole load of really interesting things being done with these at the moment. Um, now, the Xbox isn't the only system that's coming out that's got all these new cameras, these 3D cameras. This is the, uh, the Asus camera, which is called the Wave Station. Which um, I think is a bit of a, a bit of an iffy name, so we'll see how uh, how well this one does. And this is designed for the home entertainment market, or connect to TV, DVDs, and films, and things like that. And uh, television companies are getting into the game here. Toshiba, Hitachi, and a few others have already expressed interest in having these cameras built into their TVs, 
and they will allow you to control the TV uh, with gestures by waving and moving your arm instead of using a remote control. And we've got some examples here of some gestures you can do. Everything has to start with a wave, and then certain movements will change channels, adjust the volume, which okay, is, a, is an interesting idea, but um, <coughs> It feels like it could be rather clumsy compared to moving your thumb just a couple of centimetres and using the remote. But the pros and cons, okay, you don't need a remote control, but I've got to say, if I was speaking to a lot of channels, constantly waving, moving my arm around, I think people might get tired of that. So I think we've got to be careful uh, where, we use these, uh, um, where we use these interfaces. Um, Fine Sense is the company behind these new uh, gesture devices. And, uh, I'm going to talk about a competition which they ran, um, which was develop a, a web browser controlled entirely by gestures. And um, they, uh, they got a lot of entries here, um, but typically the kind of entries that they got were um, people who were taking maybe a traditional desktop browser running on Mac or Windows or something, and then trying to map on some kind of control of that browser using, using gestures, either by potentially using your hand mouse cursor or by performing uh, pre-recorded gestures. So there may be, you know, moving your hand in a triangle might mean one thing, moving in a square has another meaning. So you need to know those gestures first in order to remember them and then perform them. So it's a bit like the days of the command line interface. You have to know the commands first in order to type them in. Um, I'm going to show you the um, uh, <coughs> that came second. Uh, which is called the, uh, the Kinvi uh, by uh, Dan Z and uh, team. And he's built a virtual touchpad, left and right mouse buttons, and you can you can touch these by moving around so that you, know, you imagine that position's in front of you. So here you can see he's got a, a metaphor going through a door to access some different controls, and you have buttons laid out in front of you, put back, uh, refresh, and things like that, and then. Um, you can move through another door and then there's another panel where you can perform gestures. But I feel that this is perhaps a bit of a clunky way of, way of doing things. Again, you're emulating things that we used to, trackpads, mouse, keyboards, which work fine when you're using those devices, but why then try and uh, emulate those with, uh, with gestures? Um, now the next one, these, this is uh, the interface that came first. This is a really clever way of thinking about things. This is by uh, David Stolarski. And uh, it's called the Swim Browser. The, the, way, the way David's thought about it is, um, is by kind of completely dropping all the traditional metaphors we know for web browsing. And um, uh, you swim through links. So when you get close to a link, you can then swim through it, you swim into the next page. So you're using this, uh, this front crawl gesture to, uh, to browse the web. And then you can, you can swim backwards to go back through your, uh, the history of your pages. Obviously, this has needed a fair bit of work to make this uh, into a real browser. And um, yeah, perhaps you would feel pretty silly browsing the internet at home like that, much as you might feel a bit silly waving at the television to change the channel. But it's, it's a completely different way of thinking about it, um, which I think is really quite interesting. Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, something else now, which is um, doing away with, uh, with any kind of uh, sensors in front of you and we're now looking at uh, brain interfaces. And uh, this is the Epoch Emotive headset. Um, it's around about $500 for a developer edition. It's, it's easily available. Um, we've got one at the university here. We've not done anything with it yet. Um, and uh, uh, it fits on your head. It's wireless and it connects to uh, the, uh, the computer. And um, with this, you can pick up different uh, different kinds of brain activity. It's all quite simplistic still at the moment. Um, it'll measure four different kinds of uh, brain waves, which are um, active at different levels of kind of alertness or consciousness. And um, this can um, uh, it can kind of recognise 16 different thoughts, but it's not uh, it's not pre-programmed to just know these thoughts. You train it, so you think of something, and it kind of records. The, the electric waves your brain is emitting for that thought, and, and so it recognises that, and then you can train it with these other ones. So if you then thought of that same thing again, it would, it, it would know, okay, that was the first thing, the second thing, etc. Um, so you can't, you can't pull thoughts out of people's heads. 
but it's uh, it's interesting to look at for um, uh, for controlling systems. And um, uh, here's just some examples of some visualizations that we're able to get with this uh, with this software showing where the activity is localized. Um, now, if you are uh, feeling a bit more adventurous, uh, this is some new research done at Washington State University. Um, this is called, um, I think this is called uh, semi-invasive um, <laughs> brain surgery. Uh, I feel that's quite invasive, but um, basically a section of someone's skull is removed and then a layer of electrodes is, uh, is laid down across the, uh, uh, the dual mask, the outer layer of the brain, and um, then you're plugged into, uh, into Facebook or something. Um, and uh, this this again works in a similar kind of way to the, the headset we saw previously. They've got this recognising four different vocal sounds at the moment. So this will recognise something like E, U, R, A, and A. Um, so not a lot of data coming back yet, but one thing they have tried to do is map these four sounds to a cursor. And someone who's in this experiment was able to move a cursor around the screen by just thinking of these different kind of vocal sounds. Um, so it's, uh, it's early days. But um, I don't know, I know these kind of things might be more commonplace. Um, but more seriously, this kind of thing could be very useful uh, for people with certain disabilities um, you know, uh, to, to allow them to communicate and use uh, computers and things like that. Um, so uh, at, the, at the other end of the spectrum, if you're, if you're feeling a bit squeamish, you don't have to have the top of your head taken off. This is the, uh, the MindFlex toy, which is a really basic one. Um, We've got one of these up and running here at the open day, so you might be able to go with this. And this just measures uh, concentration or activity. And the idea is it's a bit like a mousetrap game. You have to concentrate and get a ball through a maze. Um, uh, very, very simplistic. Um, okay, so we've uh, we've looked at a uh, a number of uh, number of different devices here, a number of different kinds of uh, kinds of interacting. And um, these, um, these kind of uh, technologies and devices are going to open up a whole new um, kind of spectrum of ways that we can think about interacting with computers. And um, when we're thinking about designing interfaces and interactions, we should be careful not to get stuck trying to kind of shoehorn old style methodologies into these uh, new technologies. Um, because as we saw with the browsers, Old mental models typically don't work with, uh, with these new kinds of, uh, of technologies. So uh, I'll say thanks very much for uh, coming on. I'd be interested to hear thoughts and any questions.